Welcome back to the service tonight. Glad that you're here. I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts chapter number 10 with me this evening. Acts chapter number 10. And uh, I want to begin tonight's message by just reading one verse of Scripture. We'll be looking at many other Scriptures in this chapter, but we'll just start with one. And the verse I'd like you to find is in Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 34. Acts 10.34, we have the words of Peter here, and he says this, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Tonight, I'd like to challenge you with a unique thought. And I'd like to use the Apostle Peter to do so. You know, we know a lot about Peter's life. The Bible has much to say. We read about Peter in the Gospels, and we read about him in the beginning of the book of Acts. And of course, we gain a little bit of insight through the books that are named after him. But you'll see a difference in the man Peter in the Gospel as to the man that we read about in the book of Acts. They were completely different men. Before Peter entered into the history of the book of Acts, we find that he was a man that was often outspoken. He was a man that often had a very arrogant and proud attitude. He was this man that went around and said, Lord, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. He was very good at making bold statements, but he was not so good at actually following through with what he declared and he stated he would do. And I think one of those that we often refer to and think of is when Peter told the Lord, he said, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Lord, whatever the cost, whatever you require of me, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to shy away. And it wasn't but just a few hours later that Peter is recorded as denying even knowing the Lord. Not just one time, but three times. A bold declaration, but not necessarily a good follow-through. When you look at the life of Peter in the Gospels, you see a man that had a lot of failure. He failed in his faith. The time when he walked out on water, he could have kept his eyes on the Lord, but he took his eyes off and put them on the waves and the wind. And he began to sink. He was a man who failed in his focus. Often he was arguing with other disciples as to who is the greatest. He would come to the Lord even privately saying, Now Lord, you know I'm your favorite. You know that I'm the most spiritual and the Lord had to continue to bring him down to reality. He was a man who failed in his friendships, primarily with his friendship with the Lord. A man who said, I'll be your friend, I'll be loyal to the end. And when the Lord went into the Garden of Gethsemane and actually needed a friend, he said, would you watch with me for one hour? Would you just pray with me as I prepare for what I'm about to experience? And Peter could not even do that. He was a man who also failed in his follow-through. After he denied the Lord, after he saw the empty tomb, he just went back to fishing and said, I'm just going to go back to what I know. I'm going to abandon this thing called the ministry, and I am done. In the Gospels, Peter is portrayed one way. But when you move into the book of Acts, you read about a different man. Obviously, Peter had learned from some of his mistakes, and more importantly, Peter had allowed the Lord to restore him and remake him into the image that Christ actually wanted him to portray. In Acts chapter number 1, we find that Peter takes over as a senior pastor there of the church in Jerusalem. In chapter number 2, he stands up as a bold preacher and is instrumental in seeing thousands of people saved. In chapter number 3, he goes to the temple and he's able to pray for an hour. 
In chapter number 4, he reveals that he is a nobody, but Jesus is an everybody. And then in chapter number 5, he tells the rulers that he is not going to back down. He is not going to disobey. And if it cost him his very life, he is going to do what is right instead of succumb to what they've told him not to do. A completely different man. Peter had obviously gone through a transformation. But one of the things that's interesting is that although Peter had changed, God was not done changing him. You see, even though Peter had come a long way in his Christian life, in the book of Acts, he's not as arrogant. In the book of Acts, he's not as timid. In the book of Acts, he's not making bold declarations and they're not following through. In the book of Acts, he is a hero of the faith. He is a man that we would aspire to be. But yet, as God looked at Peter's life, he realized that he still had a problem and a problem that needed to be fixed. You say, what was Peter's problem? Well... He had a problem with prejudice. Peter didn't really care for the Gentile people. He didn't like their culture. He didn't like their ways. He didn't even like to be around them. He was secluded from anything that would be Gentile. So much to the point that he would not eat with them. He would not walk with them. He certainly would not fellowship with them. And it got to the point where even Peter said... I'm not even going to witness to them. Because I believe and I think that the gospel is for the Jewish people. That's the people God wants to bless. They're my people. And that was his mindset. And really what happened is this, is that Peter's personal beliefs clashed with God's perfect plan. Because God confronts him about this, he challenges him about his personal beliefs. He challenges him about the way he's thinking. And as we read in verse number 34, it is obvious here that Peter actually had a change of heart or a change of thinking because he said what? Of a truth. God has dealt with me about this and God is true. I was wrong and it is over this that I perceive or I believe that God is no respecter of persons. And what he is saying in that statement is that if God is not prejudiced, then I'm not going to be. If God said that the gospel is for all people, then that's what I believe. A little while ago, I didn't think that. That God changed my, my mind and God changed my thinking. And now I agree with God. You know, most Christians get to a certain point in their Christian life where they stop allowing God to change them. They're not interested in allowing God to change their character and they certainly do not want God to change their way of thinking. And we see this evident in the lives of believers today is that there are things that need to be changed and it's interesting how this is observed. Sometimes we look around and we can say all we want that we don't judge others or we're blind to other people's faults, but that's a lie. We see where others need to grow. We're more skilled at seeing the need in their life than in our own life. And maybe we would see that there's areas in our own life that need growth or need development. But what happens is this, is that it just goes on and on in time that these things are recognized in our lives but they are never addressed in our lives. And we grow but we're not really growing. And there's a difference there. We grow to a certain point in our Christian life, in our walk, and in our knowledge of the Lord and in our understanding of the Scriptures but then we get to a place where we say I have grown enough and now I am going to be stable and we cease to be growing as a believer. And it all comes back to this, that those believers who are not growing, it is because they have made up their mind that no matter, or no, uh, no matter how spiritual they become, they 
are not going to change their thinking about certain things in their life, in their worship, and in their ministry. And this is where Peter was. Peter had come a long way. He had grown a lot. He had conformed in many great ways into the image of Christ. He was now a prominent disciple. He was doing something for the Lord. But yet here in Acts chapter number 10, Peter had a radical personality change and it's because God changed him and Peter allowed God to change what was lacking in his life. And may I say to each and every one of us tonight that we need God to do the same in our lives. In fact, I will go so far to say that there are some of you that are the same Christians you were eight to ten years ago. You're exactly in the same place. Now, lest you pat yourself on the back and congratulate yourself, that is not a good thing. Well, preacher, I've just been consistent over these last ten years. I haven't wavered. You know, the Bible does not say that we are to be steadfast and unmovable. The Bible actually says that we are to always be abounding. We are to be steadfast and unmovable in the fact that we are ever growing and ever advancing in our walk with the Lord and in the knowledge of the Lord and in the ministry of the Lord. But yet there are many that are just content to plateau and say, well, this is where I've come. I'm doing okay. I think I'm good. And I don't need any more work in my life. I don't need to be challenged in my way of thinking. And when someone comes and challenges them, or God gets a hold of them and says, this needs to now be addressed, we give this attitude or this response, well, God, I just like who I am. God, that's just who I am. That's my personality, and I'm okay with that. You know, Peter said the same thing. He actually argued with the Lord on this, but yet at the end, he changed. Now my question for you tonight is this, can you change? Can you change? Now, before you answer that, think about it. Because we all like to think that we can change, but when it actually comes to change, there's a different story. Can you change? Or more specifically, will you allow God to change those ingrained opinions that you have? Will you allow God to change those cultural beliefs that you've developed? Will you allow God to come in and rearrange the personality traits that you have? And we all have them. Well, I'm an introvert. No, I'm an extrovert. I'm mixed up on all those things. I don't know what I am, but I like who I am. Will you allow God to do those things? Now, let me state this. Unless you're willing to change, you will limit your growth in the Lord. Unless you come to a place saying, God, I want to change. I need to change. I understand that if I'm going to go forward and be used of you in any other way, then I must have a change of mind and a change of heart regarding those things that I'm holding on to. And I want to show you a couple of things here about how change happens and what God will change if we allow Him. First of all, if we're going to allow God to change us or we want God to do a change in our life and in our thinking, the very first thing is this, is that we must be open to new experiences. We must be open to new experiences. Notice here in verse number 10 of Acts chapter number 10 that the Bible tells us that while Peter was praying, he became very, very hungry and God at that time of hunger and prayer gave him an unusual vision. The Bible says that he fell into a trance, and in verse number 11, here's the vision. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, 
and let down to the earth. Wherein there were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Now let's listen to what Peter said to the Lord as he spoke to him. In verse number 14, But Peter said, Not so. Not so. What did Peter communicate to the Lord? Well, he basically said this, I'm not going to do something that I have never done before. Have you ever said that to the Lord? Lord, I'm not going to do that. I've never done it before, but I've already determined in my mind, I've already said in my heart, I'm not going to do that. And yet that is the very thing that God is asking you and calling you to do. Now I want you to listen to me tonight. If God is going to take you to the place that He wants you to be, then you better be willing to try some new things in your life. We are such creatures of habit. We are so prone to just living with what is comfortable and what is common to us that when God tries to move us out of our comfort zone or God tries to lead us away from something that we're just not uh, willing to or thinking that we're able to, that we get this attitude, well, God, I can't do it and therefore it cannot be done. This is what the Lord gave to Peter. He said, here, Peter, this is something new for you. This is something that you've never experienced. But I'm coming to you. I'm going to teach you something. And I'm going to show you something. And I'm going to create something in you. But you're going to have to be willing to say yes to me and not no. Have you ever thought that maybe God is wanting you to do something new in your life? You ever thought that maybe God would like to change up your life? Maybe change up the dynamics of your family? Maybe that God wants to do something new in this church? Something that you haven't thought of? Something that you haven't been able to really meditate and, and think through, but yet God already knows and God has already determined and when he comes to you with this and says, Now I have something for you. I know that it's different. I know that it's not something that you're accustomed to. But I want you to do this. Could it be that God is not able to do something great because you're hindering him from doing that? Because you've come to the Lord and said, Not so. I'm not going to do those things. Now the Lord had to break Peter out of an old mindset. Peter was living in the past. Peter was still living under the old ceremonial law. Peter was still caught up in tradition. He was trying to live in the Old Testament days when he ought to be living in the New Testament era. And the Lord said, some things have changed here, Peter. Some things have been developed now. I have a different plan, I have a different agenda, but Peter was saying, well Lord this is how we've always done it, this is how I was raised, this is what I'm accustomed to, and so Lord we can't go around messing with the way things have always been done. Now this was serious, do you understand that Peter believed that the gospel was only for the Jews? But yet through this vision what the Lord was showing is that, you know, that's how it was before it was for the Jews, but now it is for all people and it is for the Gentiles. Yes, the Jews still have opportunity. I want to reach them to the Jew first, but now I want you to also go to others. And Peter was saying to the Lord, No, Lord, we can't do that because that's not the way it's been done before. You know, my friend when we're willing to leave our comfort zone and we're willing to do something different, we'll begin to discover that God has a plan that is much bigger than us. I think that's a lot of the issue is that our world revolves around us. And so if it's something different than what we want or something different than what we've decided, 
then it must be wrong. It must not be of God. But yet often it is God who is coming to push us out of our comfort zone. It's the Lord that is coming saying, I want to broaden your horizons. I want to expand your borders. I want to do something great. And yet we look around and say, well, God, it can't be done because I just don't think that that's the way it ought to be done. See, all of us have great potential. That is until we say, God, I'll never do that. I want you to write something down. This is more in the personal. But until, until I am willing to do something that I've never done before, I will never see God do something I've never seen before. Until I am willing to do something that I've never done before, I'll never see God do something I've never seen before. The men and women of Hebrews 11 that we mentioned last night, all of them had to step out and do something they had never done before. Can you imagine being Noah? I want you to build a huge boat. Last year, the Perks family were able to come and visit us, and we got to go down into Kentucky and see Noah's Ark, or I guess it's Ken Ham's Ark, his replica of it. And one of the things I was amazed at on that trip is just actually when you enter into that park and you look at this boat, it's massive. And not just to know that that's something you have to build, but then God was going to fill it with animals. Noah had never done that before. But because he said yes to God, he saw God do something God had never done before. And you go down the line with every man and woman that God used in great and mighty ways, that they came up with obstacles, they came up to things, they said, God, I don't know if it can be done, I don't know if it should be done. God, this has never happened before, but yet God said, if you'll trust me and if you'll obey me and if you'll continue to live by faith, I will do something great in your day. I will do something great in your life and you'll see me do the miraculous. See, I think sometimes the reason we're not open to new experiences is because we really don't want to see God do miracles in our life. It's easier just to Stay complacent and complaining. That's what we know. That's what we're comfortable with. You know, if God removed all the complaints, I think some of us wouldn't know what to talk about. <laughs> we wouldn't have a prayer list. We wouldn't have any conversation. But you know, for me, I'm tired of the complaints. I'd rather talk about the miraculous. But I've come to understand and realize that if I'm going to see God do miraculous things, I'm going to have to be open to something new. But not only that, we see this, that if we're going to change, we have to be open to necessary exposure. See, not only did God tell Peter to eat something new, but He sent three men to Peter's house to ask him, to evangelize somebody new. See, around the same time that Peter was having this dream, earlier in the chapter we read of a man by the name of Cornelius who happened to be a Gentile man, and this man was also having a dream. And his dream was this, as he was praying to the Lord, Lord, send me somebody that will tell me the truth, give me the answer to the longing in my heart, and that is how do I get forgiven of my sin? How do I have assurance of my salvation? How do I know that I'm right with you? And God gave him a dream, and He said, Now, I'm going to send a man to you. And this is how you make contact with this man. And so as Cornelius was getting a message from God that was sending him to Peter, God was giving a message to Peter that would ultimately send him to Cornelius. Now, here's a question for you. 
Do you think that these men would have met if God had not divinely arranged it? I don't think so, and here's the reason why. Peter wasn't seeking or desiring to reach the Gentiles. I mean, if a Gentile was on the street, Peter would just walk right by him. He wasn't thinking, well, maybe I should take out a gospel track and hand it to this guy. Maybe I should invite him to our church services. Maybe I should just be bold and say, Sir, if you were to die today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? No, that was not on Peter's radar. The only people that Peter was concerned about, praying about, engaged with were the Jews. So if Cornelius came and knocked on his door and said, I heard you're a preacher and you have the truth of the gospel, Peter would have probably just said, I'm sorry, buddy, and closed the door. But yet God told Cornelius, you find a man named Peter, and don't worry, I'm going to change Peter that he'll actually want to talk to you. I wonder how many people are in the Frederick area that God is preparing to hear the gospel, but the holdup is the messenger. That God has not been able to get through to some Christian, some believer, to the point where they're saying, all right, God, I'm going to expose myself. I'm going to be involved in something that is going to put me out of my comfort zone and get me in a place where I'm just a little uncomfortable, but I'm willing to do something new for you. I'm willing to change my mind and reach people that I haven't even considered or I haven't even thought about, or if I have, I've already said, not going to do it. See, that's what God's interested in. I believe that's why God kicks us out of our comfort zone so that we may be exposed to people outside of our little circle of friends and family. Because that's, in all honesty, where we like to hang out, isn't it? We like to be around those that we know. We like to be around those that we're comfortable with, that we're being accepted by. We don't want to go to those that are going to require us to step out and do something that we've never done before. Much of my ministry experience was not gained in the classroom. Now, I went through classes. I was taught. I was instructed. But you know, most of my ministry experience was actually gained in a padded room. A padded room. No, I was not in the psych ward. But early on, before really even I got into the ministry, I was invited to join a jail ministry. When I was asked, would you like to join our jail ministry? I told the man who asked me, no thank you, that's not what I do. I do this type of ministry. I teach a Sunday school class. I'm an usher. I do this, I do that. That's what I'm good at and that's what I'm going to do. He said, well, how about you pray about it and let me know? I said, well, I already let you know. <laughs> but I thought, well, I'll do the spiritual thing. I prayed about it. I thought, you know, this guy's just going to continue to bug me, and I don't want to look stupid or foolish in his eyes, so I'll go one time. So I went, and I sat there in a room full of men. And it was there that God said, you can do this. You can teach them. You can reach them. But God, these aren't my people. These men have massive problems. These men look weird. These men talk differently. God, I am much more apt for the good church people. And God said, no, this is where I want you to be. You know, I was in that system for over 10 years. And it was through that experience that I believe that God taught me much about ministry and about how to deal with people and to love people that are unlovable. But you know, I had to step out of my comfort zone. I had to, I had to have an exposure of my flaws and my feelings and my preferences. And I had to be opened up for people to see who I was to actually be able to minister to them. 
You know, there are some people, well, I wouldn't say just some people, I think a lot of people today, they see through our fakeness. They see through our little facade. You know what? Most people in our community today don't care how spiritual or how religious you are. What they're looking for is just somebody that's going to be genuine. Someone is just going to come and say, this is who I am. I got problems. I got issues as well. Not highlighting them or belaboring them, but just coming in and saying, you know, I don't feel adequate to do this, but this is what God has called me to do. And this is what God has directed me to do. And I'm going to learn and I'm going to do my best. And I'm going to seek the Lord and trust the Lord and allow Him to broaden and to expand my horizon. And that's essentially what Peter was being asked to do. The Lord came to him and said, Peter, you need to start reaching the Gentiles. But you know, for Peter to start reaching the Gentiles, he had to be exposed to a Gentile. He had to get around some Gentiles. And you know that's what the Lord did? Because look in verse number 19 here. It says, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. He's sitting there thinking about it. I mean, he's seriously considering this. Lord, should I or should I not? And as he's sitting there praying about it, thinking about it, really what he's doing, trying to find a reason why not to do it, the Lord just says, oh, by the way, Peter, three men are going to knock on your door here soon, and I want you to talk to them. Verse 20, Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius a centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee to, into his house and to hear words of thee. So what's going on here? They come to him and they tell him, you're to come with us and you're to witness to this Gentile man by the name of Cornelius. Now I want you to see something here. In verse 23, Peter had Gentiles come to his home and they ended up staying the night. In verse 23 as well, Peter walked out of Jewish Joppa with a group of Gentiles. In verse 24, Peter entered a Gentile family home. And you'll see this in verses 28 and 29, that Peter was uncomfortable with it all. Listen to what he said. Verse 28, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. I mean, Peter's just honest with them. I've not been around you guys before. I've never allowed somebody to spend the night. I've never had a meal with a Gentile. I've never talked to them in this way. And I just want you to know this. I'm a little uncomfortable with the whole situation. But look at the end of verse 28. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Can you be uncomfortable and still serve the Lord? Yeah, you can. Can you say, well, this is not my forte? This is not really the way I would do things or the way I would like it to be, but that's what God has said and therefore I'll do it. See, what Peter was saying is that the will of God supersedes my feelings and my opinions. And would to God that every one of us tonight would get over our feelings and our opinions and just do what the Lord has told us to do. 
See, God does not stutter. God does not complicate things. He has said this, that we are to go into all the world. We are to preach the gospel to every creature. We are to minister to all mankind. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That there is a ministry everywhere and amongst every person, and yet it is us that comes and says, Well, God, this is what I will do, and this is what I will not do. And God is saying that if you're going to be usable, then it's this, whatever you want me to do, God. I'm not going to put myself in a little box and say these are the things that I will do and you may choose from that God. And yet that's what many of us are doing today. We say that we want change. But do we really want the experience that comes when God changes us? You know, Peter had to get around people that was different. And he had to learn how to minister to them. So if we want change, then we're going to have to be open to new experiences. We're going to have to be open to necessary exposure. But I want you to see something else. This is quite interesting. If we want to change, then we're going to have to be open to never-ending explanations. See, word had gotten out that Peter was hanging out with a bunch of Gentiles. And Peter, in chapter number 11 of Acts, he goes down to Jerusalem, and there's a group of believers, Jewish believers, that were waiting for him. And they were not waiting there to congratulate him, to say, good job, Peter, on expanding your ministry and seeing God do great things. In fact, the Bible says here, in chapter number 11 and verse number 3, that they confronted Peter and they said, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. Why did you do that, Peter? You are a Jew. You have a standard. You must do the things the way they're supposed to be done. You need to answer for yourself. Now, I'm just going to say this. When God is doing a transforming work in your life and you're allowing Him to do it, often those around you won't understand what God is doing. You know, we need to not be so concerned about what others think. There have been things that God has led me to do and things that God has directed me to pursue. And I've had other preachers come flat out and tell me what you're doing and how you're doing it will never work and it can't work and it's probably out of the will of God. Okay. That's your opinion. But it doesn't change the fact of what God told me to do. I've had people that have come and said, well, why are you doing what you're doing? And I've opened this book and I've showed them, well, because the Bible says that. And they said, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but that's not how it's done. Okay, that's your opinion. Peter had to answer for himself. They came and said, Peter, why are you breaking with tradition? Why are you doing something radical? And you know why it is that people will often contend with you and resist you in what you're doing and question you on why you're doing it? They often do that because they themselves are afraid of change. Because if you start to rock the boat, they may actually fall out of the boat with you. Or at the very least, they're going to be seen for who they are as you go on and advance for the cause of Christ. Listen, we need some Christians who are open to change simply for this fact alone so that God can use them to change the wrong attitudes of other people. I mean, where does change begin? I, I think sometimes as a church and, and as a church family, we, we look around and we say, well, I want change around here. Man, we need change. We must have change. And we look around to everybody else saying, well, when are, when are others going to change? Well, if this person will change, then I will change. If this person will have a different opinion about this matter, then I may have a different opinion. Well, how about you? 
How about you say, I'm going to change? How about you follow what the Word of God has said and come to the point where you say, okay, this is what God is leading me to do. This is what God has laid on my heart. I'm going to follow the Word of God. And if others don't follow and if others don't understand, it doesn't matter because God does not change. And that's what Peter told them. Look at verse 4. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying... And he goes through the whole thing again in verse number 9. He simply said this, I was wrong. God came to me in a vision. He spoke to me and he said, What I've called clean, you don't call unclean. He was honest with them. He said, My thinking was wrong. In verse number 10, Peter said, I was changed. God showed me what was right, and I changed my mind. In verse 15, he said, I was used of God. I went there and I preached to Cornelius. He and his fa uh, family got saved. Other Gentiles got saved. God used me in a great way. I'm excited about it. And look at what happened in verse number uh, 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as He did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could not withstand God? And you know what happened? The Bible says in verse 18, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God. Peter just said this, I was like you. I had a way of thinking that I thought was right. God confronted me, and I figured out God's right and I was wrong. I changed. I let God use me. I'm excited about the fact that I'm used of God. I glorify God. I did His work. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to gripe about it. And He just laid it out there, and guess what? Other people said, well, if God could change you, maybe God could change me. If God could use you to do something exciting, then maybe God could use me to do something that is exciting. See, all it takes is one who will allow God to change them, and the result is that revival will break out. I still believe this, that God is still waiting for one person here in this church to really come to that place where they say, God, I am fully submitted, I'm going to do it your way. And I think it will infect the rest of the church family. But so often we're afraid of what others will think. Well, if we go too radical, people may leave the church. If we go too radical, we may get a name. Well, let me turn it around this way. If you don't go radical, what happens? You know, the church in Jerusalem started a Gentile ministry. That's a pretty good thing, a Jewish church having a Gentile ministry. In fact, the church in Jerusalem sent a preacher to find a preacher who God had called to reach the Gentile nations. They went and found the Apostle Paul. And they helped support that man to go out and reach the Gentiles. See, brethren, all I'm saying is this is don't be afraid of change. God does some great things when His people are willing to change their way of thinking. You may recall in the Gospels before Peter really changed, Peter opened his mouth a lot. Whenever he opened his mouth, it was kind of watch out. And we don't know what's going to fly out of this guy's mouth. He's going to say something crazy. Lord, I'm going to die with you. No one took him seriously. And when he came to the Lord and he said, Lord, I'm going to go to prison with you. I'm going to die with you. I'm going to stand beside you. The Lord said, that's nice, Peter. But Peter, I prayed for you because I know you. You've not been converted yet. Your mind has not changed yet. But he says, when you have been converted... Strengthen the brethren. Acts chapter number 10 is God's fulfillment of that prophecy. 
Here Peter was used of God to really set missions on fire for the world. The brethren at that time needed a Peter to stand up and say this. Hey, brothers and sisters, it's okay. God said we can reach the world. And he led, he led a spiritual movement that in the first century the world was reached because one man said, God, I'll change my thinking. We all want change, but not all of us want to be the leaders of change. Maybe tonight God has been addressing something that you have held on to way too long. You know that's what God is wanting you to do. You know that's what God's wanting in your family, what He's wanting in your church, but yet because you're afraid of change, because change makes you uneasy, you've said, not so, Lord. Well, my friend, what happens is this, is it will stop your ministry and it will deaden your spiritual life. How about take a bite of those creeping things God has laid before you? If God says it's good, then it's good. Amen. Let's have our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Can God still change you? We all like to say that God can that God is open to, that I'm willing. I mean, if God would just come and tell me what I need to change, then I'll do it. Well, that's easy to say. But if you make that declaration, count on it, God's going to challenge you on something. And He's going to ask you to be the leader, to take the lead. And to allow that change to come about so that he can do a greater work. Tonight as we have a word of prayer and come to a time of invitation. I don't know what God's been speaking to you about. I don't know specifically what God is speaking to this church regarding. But I know this. That God is always wanting to challenge us. And to change us. And to grow us. He will never do it outside the bounds of his word. He just knows that for us to advance, we need to keep on advancing and moving forward in His Word. Father, I thank You for the opportunity tonight to preach Your Word. I pray that Your people would hear it and respond in a way that would bring about lasting change. A change, Lord, that would radically change their life, their family, their church, and their community. Help us not to be so afraid of you pushing us out of our comfort zones and doing something different. May we not fear men and what they think, but may we be a people that fear you and desire to please you and bring glory to your name. So Lord, I pray that you'd use us as you see fit. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. Take this time to talk to the Lord about your life about what's going on. Guaranteed in all of our lives tonight, there's something that God's trying to change about us. And whatever God tries to change is always for our good and it's for the benefit of others. When God gets a hold of a life, He makes it better. Will you let God change you this evening?